Hi, I'm Buck Purley. I'm a team lead and senior software engineer at Unchained. I've been working at Unchained for about four years, working on various pieces of the wallet infrastructure. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today uh, with you. Uh, we're going to talk about kind of an obscure problem uh, about really how on our engineering team we think about the, the software that we're building, about the mental models, really the domain model of, of our code and how it maps onto the real world ways that our users interact with our, our platform, the wallets, their keys, their balances, etc. Please take a journey with me as we weave a mental model for collaborative custody. To start, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what Unchained does, and it actually it, it, it will all uh, connect together with the idea of these mental models. So Unchained has basically Bit Bitcoin financial services all built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, the, the Bitcoin blockchain and its wallets and balances, addresses, it's all intricately woven together with um, how our users interact uh, with the platform. So we provide vaults, which is for our custody, uh, which uh, we, where we allow our customers to control their keys or, it, or collaborate with other uh, institutions that they, they trust to hold uh, some of the keys in their forum. Uh, we have lending, uh, of course, on top of the same Bitcoin wallets and, uh, and general, generally business services, uh, IRAs, trading, uh, etc. Um, so now we're not just Bitcoin financial services, we're Bitcoin financial services on top of collaborative custody. Uh, now that's not just a buzzword for us, it's really core to everything we do. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that means and how we think about that on the engineering team. So what is collaborative custody uh, and, and why do we build on top of it? So you can see that a big thing that we talk about is just reducing the risk of loss from hacks, right? It's harder, it's not just somebody gets access to your account and they have now access to your funds because we're splitting up uh, the, the risk so there's not this like single point of failure. It also allows for us to maintain transparency of assets. You can always verify the balances of your wallet because you control your wallet, you control your keys, you can load them up into an external coordinator like Caravan or Sparrow. You can also share control only as necessary. So you have control over this. It's not just saying, hey, Unchained, hold onto my Bitcoin for me and I'll let you know when I need some. You can, you don't have to fully trust us and in our default vaults where you hold two of the keys, you're not trusting us for anything except really recoveries. You have full control and you can really fine tune that as, as you see fit. An offshoot of that is that there's no risk of us going insolvent and losing your funds. You control your funds, they're yours. We're just a partner in this, this custody. And as I mentioned earlier, reducing single point of failure for insolvency and security, et cetera. This, all, all of this is built on top of this idea of a network of keys. This is what really allows us to, to provide these benefits of collaborative custody. So again, our default is Unchained might have one key, then our clients will have two keys. You might have another institution uh, with our delegated custody model that uh, has one of those keys. And so really nobody has full uh, spending control. And it's really this network, this collaboration. This is not an easy thing to build on top of. Really though, the easiest is you give us your funds, we'll put them in cold storage, move them to hot wallets as necessary, and we'll track your balances, we'll give you an address as you need. That's, uh, that has its own challenges, but there's less integrations with the outside world that you have to deal with and a lot of other you know, backups. And So I wanna talk about the engineering challenges here. What is it that we have to deal with when we build on top of collaborative custody? Before we get to that, what we're building up now is uh, a domain model, a way to think about these systems that we're building. Now, what is a domain model and why should we even care about it? You can think about it as a, um, from the Wikipedia entry, uh, this is really a software engineering uh, concept where we are creating a conceptual model that incorporates both behavior and data. So you can think about the behavior side as how the kind of the real world works um, in, in this area, in this domain, and then the data is how that interacts in our software. So this gives us a, again, a formal representation of, of, of the, the platform, the pieces, the software that we're trying to build. 
So this gives us a framework for conceptualizing problems, clearer code because they reflect the real world uh, systems that we're interacting with. It gives us more flexibility in the data models because actually having these types of constraints where we come up with a constrained data model that reflects the real world gives us flexibility to work within those constraints and actually build without the risks of creating an overly complex and error prone software. Uh, it also gives us clear model boundaries. You know you're kind of moving beyond what your system should be doing if the concept doesn't fit within the domain model that you're building. So in our specific domain where we're talking about collaborative custody interacting directly with a, a Bitcoin wallet, what are the engineering challenges that we have to deal with at Unchain? Well, one problem is that lost Bitcoin cannot be replaced, right? If, uh, if there is a hack at an exchange, if they're not insolvent, funds can be recovered. Now, at Unchained, if funds are lost from your wallet, they're your funds, uh, it's, and so they can't, those, those balances are, are intricately tied to that wallet. So we can't just, you, you can have new deposits go into them, but the state of that wallet has, has changed uh, unalterably at that point. Key replacements. So again, because we're managing keys, we're not just saying this is your, this user's balance. Key management is a really key part of the collaborative custody model and the relationship that we have with our customers. And so if a key becomes compromised uh, in, in a particular wallet or a vault or a loan, uh, um, even if it's not compromised, but you want to switch it out, you want to switch partners, a key replacement is a very challenging exercise to go through, both from a user experience point of view and also from an engineering and modeling perspective. Um, and this leads to another complication, which is maintaining history across wallet configurations. So you can think about basically if you switch out the keys uh, in, in a wallet, you switch out one of the keys, but you have this one vault, you think about like a bank account balance. If some security model has to change in the bank, your balances don't change at all, right? But for a Bitcoin wallet, if you change out one of the keys, that's a totally new wallet. So all of the balance history that you had from that previous wallet is technically gone. And so there is a challenge of how do you connect those wallets if you have done a key replacement to maintain that history and state. And then in general, just evolving standards. We build directly on top of standards that are developed within the Bitcoin ecosystem. As those change, how do we evolve with them? How do we follow best practices? And to do that in a way when our users have control over their wallet can be very challenging. I want to review some key terms. Uh, we're going to basically what we're going to do to build out this model is think about the, 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 the names in Bitcoin that people are familiar with. If you've, if you've interacted with kind of traditional open source wallets or if you've looked at Bitcoin improvement proposals, if you've read some of our blog posts, seen some of our other video content. Uh, and we're going to try and connect those into like a more full fledged uh, domain model. So we'll start kind of at the top and you think about a master seed or a key. This is when you, you know, load up a new device, you take your, the 24 words, you write them down, you preserve them. Uh, you have, there's three of these that are kind of at the root of a two of three multi-sig wallet. So that's the first piece. From that, you can derive extended public keys. So you take that seed, you can derive XPubs or extended public keys from that. You can then take these XPubs, you can generate more XPubs, uh, and you can put them together in a configuration. There's, we have wallet configuration files that you can download at Unchained. Um, from our platform, you can combine these into descriptors, uh, and this, this basically defines a configuration from which we can derive addresses. Uh, you then have a wallet, which incidentally is made up of two descriptors, um, and uh, this is a shorthand called the wallet policy that describes basically a two of uh, a two of two wallet here. It says uh, basically it's a witness script hash, a segwit, multi-sig, and where you require two signatures for these two XPubs, and these are basically shorthands for those values. So this is the next step up once you have the descriptors, the XPubs, the seeds. And finally, now you, you have a way to generate addresses and recover addresses from that previous information. From that, we get redeem scripts, which then can be compiled down to addresses. So a redeem script defines what's protecting your Bitcoin, which is these two public keys, op2, that maps to that ball policy and the descriptors that we saw earlier. This redeem script, you can see here, also op check multisig, uh, then turns into an address, uh, which is a representation essentially of the locking script, which um, you, can, you can redeem if you with signatures. 
my talking through that, you can kind of see the complexity. How do these things connect? How do you talk about them in a clear way? How do you communicate these concepts to somebody who does not know all the lingo of, of Bitcoin? This includes even technical uh, developers who are, know how to how to program a server or a database, but they're less familiar with some of these more technical terms because they're not really natural. And that's what we're gonna try and build out here. What are the problems that we have here? Well, we don't have a relationship between XPubs and the quorum. So you have these XPubs, but like how does that XPub relate to the quorum of keys when we're creating a wallet? We lose the relationship between keys when one is replaced. So I showed some, uh, the, the descriptors and the wallets. Now, if you replace the keys, remember, we wanna kind of maintain that history and that relationship. There's no, that, that is not expressed in these, these, this terminology that, it, that we just went, walked through. It lacks expressivity for representing different models. So how do you do uh, two, what, what's the difference between a two of three and a three of five? And uh, how are we generating these redeem scripts? And what's the, what happens during these rekeys? We don't really have a way to represent these relationships. And another thing is that, as I mentioned, wallets have two descriptors. We have one for uh, receiving from external sources and one for change, basically receiving from internal sources. What's the difference between them? What's the relationship between them? Uh, it's just not very clear. They're just descriptors. Descriptors can also just represent a single public key, a private key, single sig. It's just, it, it's, um, it's, it's not ironically very descriptive of what they're trying to do for our particular use case in a collaborative custody environment. So this is why we at Unchained developed the Brave model. We had originally a, uh, a system that was optimized for a loan environment, which was very much like old Bitcoin wallets, which just had individual, uh, um, basically public-private key pairs. Your wallet would just generate these at random as needed. You'd keep them together. We would generate uh, our addresses for our loans in a, in that followed more modern standards, but this was still originally when we built it back in 2016, and we were just building around loans, which are very static. And we called this in, in that domain model, escrows. When you think about an escrow, like in a lending environment, it's basically, it's very static. You deposit into an escrow, it's held in escrow until a loan is paid off. And then uh, when you paid off the principal and your interest, you then redeem your collateral and you're good to go. Wallets are much more uh, dynamic and you might be depositing a lot more, withdrawing a lot more. And this single escrow is kind of like one dimensional way of, think, of, of looking at things. It just doesn't work as well. So we were kind of still just generating these kind of like single addresses at a time and we needed to have a more dynamic model. Uh, to express all of these other ideas that we were talking about with wallets and descriptors. So the braid model. We're gonna start with seeds here, and we can kind of think of these as like a spool, right? We're gonna be building out a braid. So you think about where um, is spool of thread or yarn, right? And from that, you have each quorum member is going to contribute their own seed, and uh, they're not gonna, going to actually expose their seed, but they're going to bring their seed to the table when they pl pl plug in their device. And from that, we're going to extract an XPUB. But in our model, we're going to call that a strand, so a strand of thread or yarn. OK, so we have now three strands. N strands contribute to an M of N quorum. That's how we typically describe multi-sig wallets, M of N, right? So here we have, in this model, three strands. And in an unchained wallet, that would be a two of three. Strands are going to be woven together to create a braid. Now, what are braids? Now, if you think about braids in the physical world, there's a linear relationship between the strands and the braid, right? Each strand starts at the same place. They end at the same place. As you move along, in the, along the braid, you're moving along by the same amount of each strand as well. This is really important because in a multi-sig wallet, order is important. When you're generating those redeem scripts, when you're trying to get public keys, every time you move up an index, you are describing where on each strand you want to pull a public key to generate the address, to generate the public key, to contribute to the address, and eventually to gather signatures from as well. And this mental model also supports the ability to change out strands, right? This is the, the key replacement idea where you can think about taking out a strand adding a new one at a particular place in the braid, or taking two related strands together and adding a new one to it. Now we have a new braid. That's a key replacement. All right, so now we have our braid, where we have our three X pubs, our three strands are put together. And now we want to get an address. Well, what does that look like? 
Here we can see an idea where we're creating a redeem script from this. So if we start here and you think about this three-dimensional, you're moving along the braid and then you get to the point where you want to pull out an address. We're taking a point here. Each one of, at this point, each strand is going to contribute a public key. And from there, on this side, you can see we have at this particular index, we're saying this is the zeroth index, we're going to be able to generate an address based off of those public keys. It's all the same index for each strand. This is what we call a slice. So a slice is a cross section of a braid at any point in its length, right? You're moving along, you take a slice, same index along for each strand. In that respect, and at that point, it reflects the topology of the strands. And an important point of multisig is there's a, there's a, a standard in Bitcoin multisig for predictable ordering of the public keys. So just because you've given the XPubs in a particular order to create this multi-sig wallet, that doesn't matter. What matters is that we're always gonna, we're gonna um, deterministically order the public keys at that point, depending on where you are on the strand and the, XPub, and the public keys that have come out. And as we move along the braid, the, the index for each public key, the derivation is, is incremented by the same amount. And this makes the shape of that slice deterministic. So you can see here, as we move along, new slices, uh, different ordering, uh, potentially, of the public keys based off of their origin strand, and we get our addresses. What this gives us is that this means that in this collaborative environment, two people that are part of the same forum, because we have the same model for how these braids are built, we can independently generate the same address. We know exactly how those things are going to be uh, 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 compiled. So you can see how these ideas map onto the terms that we talked about earlier, right? We have the seeds and the keys, we have the XPUBs, which are the strands, the strands come together into these descriptors, and then from the, descript from the descriptors of the braids, we can take a slice to generate addresses. Here we can see how all of these ideas kind of map onto the terminology that we talked about earlier that is more, more uh, uh, established in the Bitcoin ecosystem, right? So we have what we start with our seeds and our keys. Those uh, contribute XPUBs or their strands. And from those strands, we create a braid. Those can map onto descriptors or wallet configurations. And as we move along the braid, we can take slices and generate addresses from them. But why is this important? Just talking about pretty names, we can come up with pretty pictures. Well, one thing that's really helpful is that we've clearly modeled a relationship, right? Before, and you just taught, when I talk about a public key or an XPUB or a seed, there's nothing inherent to that, to those names um, that kind of evokes the, the relationship between them. But now when I talk about strands and braids, you can really think, you, you, you visualize the relationship between those XPUBs and the descriptors and the wallets. The other nice thing is that it kind of gives us a vocabulary to describe what a wallet really is, right? A wallet contains two braids. You have a change braid and a receive braid. Uh, before, we could only say that a wallet has two descriptors, but what kind of descriptor? Well, it could, you know, maybe there are two single sig descriptors. It's not actually inherent in the terminology there. Nice thing is that at a database le level, this allows us to really model some very interesting things where generally uh, we've, we've mostly we mostly just think about balances, for example, at the address level, how much have I deposited into this address? And at the wallet level, what's the total balance of funds that I have? But if we've modeled out our system correctly, you can think about a strand having a balance, an individual braid having a balance, um, and, and then of course the wallet and the slices themselves having balances too. So this can be really useful for, for building out more comprehensive, complex system. Another thing that this does is it, it allows us to more clear, to, to allow for more extensibility. So there's opportunities to upgrade in, in that we're not as tightly coupled to script types, for example, right? There's nothing inherent to a braid. This is, it has to be SegWit, it has to be P2SH. So uh, be, by decoupling that type of, those types of ideas, we can have a SegWit braid and a, that's come, that where a different strand is contributed just in the same way that we do a Reiki. And this model is like flexible enough to, to, to allow for that. Um, another thing it does is it more effectively models or allows us to model newer ideas in the Bitcoin, Bitcoin e ecosystem, things like blinded XPUBs, where you're thinking about actually you're contributing a blinded strand to a wallet. And you can, and, and 
and how that might be built out. Again, it, it evokes that imagery in a way that you can, th you can see how these different models might be connected and built out. And so by putting all this together, hopefully you can see the benefits of coming up with a domain model, coming up with a language that reflects the things that we're trying to build. We're not just writing code to generate an address. An address is more than just a string that's deposited to, right? An address is a reflection of a relationship between different key owners. People come to their, their wallet, come to their account on Unchained, they might contribute a strand, a key, an XPUB, and they're gonna weave it together, create a braid with their collaborators. And then that is what is in an address, is a reflection of all of those layers, those relationships, um, the relationships between the keys, the relationships between the strands, the XPUBs. And all of this can now be uh, reflected in our code, which allows us to build out uh, functionality, build out features that reflect the underlying logic and power of the Bitcoin blockchain that we're building upon. So thank you uh, for taking this journey with me about how we think about building out uh, collaborative custody solutions uh, for Bitcoin native financial solutions.